Well, Polly, it's so nice to have you back. Would you please ask your question? Yes, thank you very much, Zena. Hi, thank Tom. You. It's <clears throat> nice to be back uh, after a while. <laughs> uh, so let me read my question. Um, over the past seven years since I discovered your MBT model, I have tried really hard to grow up uh, by letting go of my fears. I believe that my intent to do this was uh, and is still is strong, but generally I feel depleted now. <clears throat> I see that I have let go of some fears, but the quality of my life and relationships is almost the same. I saw that other people usually find an approach with which uh, they can keep their focus because they find joy and motivation in seeing the results in that particular process. For some, it is music or painting. For others, it is communicating with uh, guides, uh, or lucid dreaming or meditation. <clears throat> uh, from the start, I understood that uh, to see the results one must invest sufficient time and effort. On my journey, I also recognize that peri periods of relaxed approach are needed to integrate and process new knowledge. I also followed your advice to let go of a particular approach and revisit it after some time. I have done this with many methods again and again. I have also stopped eating sugar and foods with high glycemic index for about six months without seeing much difference when I reintroduced them back. Uh, despite many OB and LD, uh, well, OB and lucid dreaming experiences and uh, several successful group experiments uh, with uh, remote viewing and meeting in uh, non-physical reality, I still lack traction. I still don't see myself uh, within myself the knowledge of MBT being true. It is still not my truth. Uh, I think it is still just intellectual. Uh, over the years, I have uh, rigorously tested uh, maybe a dozen of, of approaches and tools. Another dozen were tested less rigorously. This way I have failed in, again and again, surely more than 100 times over the years. Some projects lasted several days, some uh, several weeks or even months. I, also pick, uh, I always pick myself up, recuperate and start again. I feel really depleted and demotivated because I never saw any significant change in my life which would motivate me to stick to any particular practice or tool which, for which I was hoping for. Uh, I don't uh, know what to do because this does not seem to work for me, but I don't see anything else besides what MBT tells us about our purpose that would give, uh, have me meaning in my life. I really need to see some success. Uh, am I really fooling myself when I think that I'm holding the intent to grow up? Can you please help me see what I'm not uh, seeing or what I'm missing? Well, that's going to be a tough one. Um, yeah, I know you've worked hard and you've been serious at it. You've been uh, visiting us here in the in this forum for uh, some years. Um, it would seem that you are having a problem getting out of your intellect, but I'm not even sure that that's true. You know, it would seem that that is probably a, a fundamental thing that as you make progress, as you feel like you're taking steps forward, your next step is to analyze it and with your intellect. And, and, and of course, when you analyze it with your intellect, that kind of takes the it kind of takes the the value out of it because that's no longer at the being level. That's now a thing at the intellectual level. It could just be as simple as you're stuck at the intellectual level, like many people in our culture, uh, and having a hard time translating what you're thinking about. The, the that you're going into these these ideas, you're exploring them, you're having, like you say, you've had some out of bodies, you had lucid dreams, you've done remote viewing that, that worked for you. So you know that these things are possible, but they're not really filtering down into change who you are and your life. So yes, all the possibilities are there. You've experienced them. You've been around other people who have experienced them. So it's not a matter of, is it real? But it doesn't seem to really be affecting you at a personal level. and that's probably that you stay in your intellect. Matter of fact, a lot of people who live out of their heads, out of their intellect, 
<coughs> they really don't know what the being level is. The being level is something that they look at with their intellect, you see, and then they're still in their intellect. I suspect it's hard for you to let go of that intellect and get into that being level. And maybe because the being level is, is one that is uh, open. The being, <coughs> the being level is where all those feelings are. There's no control over that being level. And you may feel if things get out of control, your intellect jumps in and puts them right back into place, gets them under control again. That being level is a, is a uh, kind of a, a rowdy place, can be. It's not particularly controlled. And it's a, it's a, um, I was going to say scary, but that's not so it as much as it's a place where you are vulnerable. It's a vulnerable place. If you live in that being level, now you're just really you. You're the authentic you. You can, you can be hurt. You can be taken advantage of. All sorts of things can happen there because your intellect is not in charge anymore. And that may be a scary place for you to go to be that vulnerable. So that's another possibility of why you stay in your head and don't take this material and integrate it down to a being level. Many people in our culture, particularly if they live in, and work in very left brain fields, or like, you know, computers, fields like you work in, they have to be very left brain, they have to be very analytical, their whole life, their livelihood, their paycheck, everything depends on them, you know, having a, an in control, button down intellect full of facts and information. And it's just a little scary to let all that go and live out of a being level that doesn't have any of that control. That's working more intuitively than it is intellectually. So it could be that it's just difficult for you to get down to that being level and really change yourself. You've got lots of information, so you've got a head full of facts, but those facts aren't translating to basic change in you. You're still the same person, or you feel like you're the same person. The other thing I would suggest is ask other people. Sometimes you're not a very good judge of who you are. Ask people who have known you for a decade whether they notice that you're different now than you were before. Are you more caring? Are you more thoughtful? Do you uh, think of other people and the effect you might have on them more? And you might find that other people have a, have a better judge of who you are and how you've changed than you do. They may indeed tell you that, yes, you have grown up a lot. So it may be that you just don't notice it is another, is another possibility that the other people might notice it. But if you talk to other people and they say, nope, same old Polly, known you for a decade and, you know, not any different, then it's probably true because other people will notice if there's changes. So that's the only thing I can think of, Polly, is that you're having a struggle getting it out of your head down into the being level, or as some people would say, into the heart. It um, is a scary thing, and it leaves you vulnerable, no doubt. A place that uh, particularly people who have had some kind of background where vulnerability was a bad thing. You know, vulnerability is 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 associated with abuse. Uh, then there's even a harder time getting down into that vulnerable area. You just don't want to go there. So that's what I would look at. You can examine yourself and see if that isn't part of the problem. If it is, then it's just going to take courage to go there, be different, and uh, deal with the uh, vulnerability as it comes. And you'll find the vulnerability is really not a problem. It's, it doesn't really hurt. It's not really a tar It doesn't make you a target for abuse at all. So I don't know if this is helping or not. It's just uh, the thing that kind of came off the top of my head because this is so common in our culture in our left brain culture that people are so tied up in their minds at the, at the intellectual level it's very hard for them to exist at the being level because it's they don't have any con they don't have much control there they're just being they're feeling and being they're connected to people but out of control if you will and eventually you realize you don't need control and the control always just gets in the way 
just being yourself and being authentic is good. And that if other people try to take advantage, that doesn't matter. It's okay. You can roll with those things very easily. So I don't know. Does that help any? I think it does help somewhat. Um, I, I'm hearing you say that uh, your impression of me is uh, that I am focused on control and I, I would tend to agree with that. Also with uh, the, the, the issue with vulnerability, uh, that is something that I also noticed and it is one thing that I was working on over the years several times. Um, the, the, the issue I have is really uh, to grasp something that uh, I would feel is really worth it, uh, where I can delve myself uh, in completely and um, go through it uh, with full force, let's say. And I don't know what that one thing is. That's where I was uh, looking for several approaches and I was testing and testing and nothing really came up uh, so significant as, uh, that, as, as that, that it would uh, let me believe that this is the one thing. So um, I, I don't know whether to ask you for advice. Um, I'm lost there. Okay, well, one of those things that for most people shows up as being the significant thing that really draws them in to their being level and lets, lets them uh, kind of express that, that uh, uh, you know, the, the love, the caring, and the stuff they've got in there but don't seem to be able to connect with to, to, uh, to share is a significant other. So it's that relationship. And that significant other, you know, doesn't have to be a wife or a girlfriend. You know, it could be somebody else. It could be a, your, you know, it could be your child. It could be your parent. It could be your next door neighbor. Just somebody that you really can give to. Somebody that you can, you know, you can try to to solve. Well, I shouldn't say solve their problems, but but be what they need. And that's that's not all. It's just through the intellect. But you know, significant others. Are very important in our life and um, it's whoever if you have people in your life that are significant then they will help you be that change if you're not if you're sitting all alone and you don't have any significant others then i can see that you just are kind of stewing in your own juice and don't seem to be able to go anywhere that's because of the challenges these are challenges in your giving challenges and in, in what you can do for others and if you're by yourself then this challenge for what you can do for others is, is kind of a weak thing that doesn't get any traction anywhere so i'd say look for some people somewhere that you can give to you know even if you volunteer to be a you know what we have i don't know where you live but where i live they have a thing called big brother big sister where you can find some disadvantaged child and you can just start to meet with them and spend time with them just to help them, you know, have somebody with a positive attitude, you know, to, to look up to and to, and to care for them kind of thing. So, you know, finding something significant, which has to do with relationship in your life is probably the way out. As long as you're just by yourself, assessing yourself, you know, in a kind of alone and, and uh, looking at you, not in relationship, but just as an individual, that's going to be hard. It's going to be really hard to do because most of your growing up has to do with how you interact with other. That's the that's the key part of it. So that interacting with other is uh, it's a really important part to pull you out. And if you just are by yourself, you miss that and it can make you kind of feel like you're in a slump and nothing's happening. You're not going anywhere. Well, you're not being challenged in the right ways. All your challenges are intellectual. Challenges at the being level require relationship. Yeah, and I can attest to that. Uh, I have a wife and uh, a 16 month uh, old son now. So uh, that is, well, with the son, I was surprised that uh, it is really, it has really moved me to towards uh, focusing on his needs. Uh, it was different uh, than with anybody else uh, so far. I, I didn't expect that. And I, I like to step up to the responsibility I have to be his. Uh, to give uh, an image to him 
uh, of how one can be in a good way and something like that. So yes, that's that's the place. Yeah, your wife and your child. Yeah, just keep in mind, you know, what can you do for them? How can you make them happy? How can you make that environment so that son grows up uh, into a very profitable, um, you know, a very uh, confident young man that uh, has a big picture of life and is trying to do the right thing? You know, how can you how can you do that? And it's not by lecturing him, obviously. It's by what you you know, it's by what you give to him not the intellectual stuff you give to him, but what you give to him that's not intellectual. And same with your wife. You, know, it's, uh, you just see if you can't keep that wife as happy as she can be in her relationship and her family. And that will re require you to give. That will require you to not put, not to ask for what you need. You know, well, here's what I need out of this relationship. It's to focus on what she needs out of the relationship. So you've got, the, you've got that personal connection. Just see how much you can give to it and realize that sometimes you can you can overdo the giving. You know, you can become an enabler for bad behavior just because you, you know, you uh, give inappropriately. Keep in mind that it's all about low entropy in the long run. So you need to be however it is you need to be to reduce entropy, you know, with you and your family for the long run and then be that. Whether it hurts or not, you know, you you be that, or whether you get what you want or not, be that, and that'll probably uh, make all the difference in the world. Yeah, I, I hear you with the enabling. I have, uh, I tend to have the opposite problem. I mean, well, I sort of, sort of force my uh, my wife uh, to step up to the responsibilities she should have, which isn't really making it easy for her to live with me uh, but uh, that is I, I see that as an opportunity for me to grow yeah yeah absolutely you're not the one who's necessarily supposed to decide for your wife what she needs to grow up to do you just give her an environment of love and caring and let her grow up and however it is she she does and you accept that and and love her for who she is as opposed to seeing her needs and faults and things that she has to grow up with and you're the teacher that's a wrong way to look at it that puts you in the position of of being always right and knowledgeable and her is not being right and needs to change and that tends to be arrogant and it tends to be full of ego so you need to let her be whoever she is and give her the environment where she can grow herself without your instruction Matter of fact, as you give people instruction, it's true with your children and with relatives and everybody. That is, if you give, if you try to tell people what it is they need to do, they will instinctively do the opposite. They will push back. You will, it, your, your efforts to fix them will end up backfiring. You can't fix anybody but yourself. Just fix you and let them fix themselves. Let them be who they are. And if they are doing things that are dysfunctional, they have to see that on their own because of the consequences of the dysfunction, not because you explain it to them. So that's kind of the way to live. You live trying to make them happy, whatever that means. And if that means stop complaining, well, that would probably make them happy. You see, so whatever it takes to make them happy, then uh, that's what you do. And that'll require you to let go of ego. That'll require and what's wrong and how things should be, and then trying to manipulate it to be that way, that's letting other people grow on their own, and you just giving them support to do that without the direction. They have to do it on their own. So maybe that'll help some, but it sounds like you've got everything you need to really uh, you know, grow up a whole lot. A wife and a baby is uh, about the optimal set of things to help you get rid of your ego. Thank you very much, Tom. All right, thank you, Tom. We have another question that came to us um, from Dan, and it's regarding out-of-body experiences. He had one truly successful out-of-body experiences, many, many out-of-body experience many years ago, an unforgettable, completely immersed 360 degrees, uh, and then upon falling asleep, reawakened into this out-of-body state again. This has only happened once. Since then, there's only been lucid dreams. 
and now when he tries his out-of-body techniques, he falls asleep. How can he avoid falling asleep? Why did falling asleep and then a reawakening into an out-of-body work for me that one time and never again? And he asks, what might he be doing wrong? Well, there's probably a, a list of things that he might be doing wrong. But I think one of them, most obvious, is he's probably trying too hard. When there's something you really want to do, particularly when it requires you to be at the being level, then if you try too hard, that pushes you right up into the intellectual level. So why did the one thing happen and work out that time? Well, it would probably was assisted by the larger consciousness system to show him the possibilities and to give him an idea what it was like. That would kind of light a fire under him to go find out and work on it for himself. But he has to, he has to start at the beginning. Um, it'd be wrong to assume that, well, he was there once and now he lost it. That's probably not the case. He was probably given that experience um, because it would help him focus, see a bigger picture and, and kind of light a fire under his, his desire to learn and grow. And now he's down trying to, you know, recapture that for himself on his own, you know, on his schedule rather than it just happened to happen for him. So what he has to do now is stop trying so hard. Stop pushing on it. The more you push on it, the less likely it is to happen. Uh, getting down into the being level can't be forced. It's got to be a place that you just exist naturally. And you might just start backing up and just go back to the meditation. Point consciousness. Uh, learn to be a, a point of consciousness floating in the void. Uh, that all takes place at the being level. Then learn the difference between the intellectual level and the being level. Go back and forth a lot of times between those so you can get stable in the being level. And then use your intent to, um, or if you want, you can repeat that first experience, but you can use your intent then to go explore. But don't have any ideas about what that means. Don't start with any preconceived notions. Just be open to whatever happens and accept whatever happens. And as things happen, don't start judging them and saying, nope, that's not it. That's not the way I wanted to feel. I want to have this other experience. That just gets in your way. So you probably now, because of your first experience, have a preconceived notion of what you want to do and what it's going to be like. You got to let all that go and let it happen just as it does. So bottom line is, is again, get out of your intellect, being the being level without expectation and just open up. Don't have, don't be so driven to get back to, you know, you feel like you've lost ground. You haven't really lost any ground. You were given an experience to begin with, and now you're in the learning process. You're very anxiously and maybe trying too hard to do that learning. It has to come naturally and organically, not uh, pushed. All right. Thank you, Tom. I'm going to try to catch up with some of the MBT forum questions that we had coming in that have uh, backed up for a little bit. If, if we can get through some of these, I will revisit some of the other questions that some of you had here. Um, from the MBT forum, Nick Mara is asking, and this kind of reminds me of Elon Musk's sort of a view of virtual reality. So he wants to know, how do you feel about the possibility that the virtual reality we're experiencing was created by a technologically advanced civilization and the countless UFO sightings and C5 initiated contacts? are indications that these creators could be aware of the collective growth, the quality of our consciousness. A CE5 is a protocol um, in which posi positive conscious intent can initiate contact within vast extraterrestrials. And that, that has been recorded for thousands of, t thousands of times through recent years, um, according to his, his data. Do you have any comment on that? Oh, I probably have a lot of comment on that, but there was about five questions there, all all wadded up at the end. Why don't you start with the what's the first one, and we'll go through them. Well, the question <clears throat> is, how do you feel about the possibility that the virtual virtual reality we are experiencing was created by a technologically advanced civilization? All right. Well, let's just start there. Um, that again falls into this this. Um, 
this uh, category of a possibility, but not a very likely one, I believe. <clears throat> and that is, there's some there's some problems with that. Okay, if this virtual reality is really being is really being done by a, a, an advanced civilization someplace, and we we are players in it, then there's two two things that have to happen there, and both of them have problems. One, if they're the players, and we're the virtual characters, we're the avatars. Okay, then they have to be manipulating us, all of our thoughts, all of our actions, you know, all of the time, and that doesn't make a lot of sense because they would be like we are, you know, when we play virtual reality games, we get up in the middle of it and go to the bathroom. You know, we, we take a break for lunch. We take a break for when we sleep, we take breaks for things and our character just stands around and wobbles while, while we're gone. And then we come back to it and play. Well, humans don't spend a lot of their time standing around and wobbling, waiting for a player to come back. That would mean that they would have to be there making our choices for us whenever we're making a choice, which that doesn't make sense. So they wouldn't be playing us like that kind of a, of a, uh, of a player avatar game. The only other possibility is that the avatar itself is conscious. Okay, now for the avatar itself to be conscious, then you'd have to have a game such that you had programmed consciousness for the avatar. Okay, that is problematical. Okay, so let's say you have this game and you program it. You program all the little avatars to be conscious. So they're conscious in their own right. So they don't have a player. They are their own player. And they're just uh, conscious because of this amazing computer science that these advanced people know. Well, all right. So then you start it in the past and you let it go. Right now, what's the what's the point of all of this? So here we have been evolving as humans in this environment for 200,000 years. And we have history and we have artifacts for those 200,000 years. And we have bones dug up out of the ground and we have you know, the history that uh, can account for a lot of that. So there's this game going on by our, by other humans in this universe in the future. And here we are going on day at a time, hour by hour, 24 hours a day for, you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And why would anybody do that? You can imagine the amount of uh, how exciting that game must be, you know, watching us sleep, watching us go to the bathroom, you know, watching us sit around at cocktail parties, having mindless small talk, you know, wow, that should really be exciting. I can see why those people would want to would want to do that. That's that would be so informing. You see, there's if you look at the big picture, there's not really a lot of value in that. Um you know that that would be re reality TV. You know, on uh, on steroids, you'd have all these people just going through their everyday life, doing their everyday things. You know, and uh, you get to watch them. Oh wow, that would be a lot of fun, right? Okay, that would might be a lot of fun for just a little while, but for two hundred thousand years, I don't think so. You know, for um, uh, it would just be a very slow game that would have very few moments in it. You know, you could gather together for uh, for some of the big the big moments, but there would be thousands of years where there were no big moments. It was just a bunch of people eating and sleeping and you know fighting with each other, and uh, most of it was not at all glorious, and most of it was not all that interesting. So it seemed to me that the point of it all is kind of hard to imagine. These advanced people who have such advanced lives with so much to do with their wonderful intellects and, and technologies and so on. And what they do is sit around and watch us go to the bathroom. You know, I don't think so. That doesn't, that doesn't work. The other problem with that is that you, to create consciousness like this is very problematic in itself. Computing consciousness isn't the way consciousness works. An avatar is just a picture, if you will. That elf is just a picture of an elf. 
That elf doesn't really have lungs and a heart beating and a stomach that's digesting, but the elf has to eat. And if the elf stays underwater too long, he drowns, but uh, doesn't really have to have air. You see, a, a simulation of avatars is something that isn't very complete. It's got a lot of stuff missing in it. All you, all you really want to see is the picture that shows you what's going on. Well, to have an avatar um, that is more than that, just is not, is not, um, what do I say, um, is not good computer science. You don't want to put any more effort into your, into your simulations than you need to. You don't want to compute a lot of stuff that doesn't show, that you can't actually see the results of. So computing consciousness, I don't even know that that's a possible thing to do. I think you can, you can approach, you can make a character, let's say an AI. You know, in World of Warcraft, you go up to the, you go up to the guy standing by the fence and you ask him a question and he gives you a, 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 a challenge to do tells you what you have to do. You know, you go have to find this treasure and take it to this place and that sort of thing. Well, every time you talk to that character, he says the same thing because that's his role is to stand there and say that to people. And you could make that character smarter and smarter and give him a bigger vocabulary and a larger range. And you may even be able to get him to where he approximates consciousness. But I think it's only an approximation. I think it's only an approximation. It's all algorithmic, even if it's even if it's uh, neural network based. It's still, you know, a uh, computed consciousness with limitations. And if you go to all that trouble, it seems to me that you would have to have something that was really worth it to go to that much trouble. I don't see that as a as a viable thing. I don't think the product sounds too viable. I don't think the, the um, idea that uh, we are interesting, our everyday lives, you know, all seven and a half billion of us doing what we do. We go to work each day. We turn a crank. We come home. You know, we try to get something to eat. We watch TV and we go to bed. That is not really the stuff of exciting video. That's what most of us do. That's what life is on this planet. So anyhow. I think that that is unlikely. I won't say that it's impossible. That it's just unlikely. It's much more likely that there is a larger consciousness system, that there are individuated units of consciousness that play um, avatars, and that this, all, this whole thing is about the evolution of consciousness, that consciousness is an information system. To me, that is more, that makes more sense. So it's just my opinion on that but uh i'm not uh i'm not too convinced by the uh this whole thing's being worked by people in the future it seems to me that that is the only way that one can maintain a materialistic viewpoint when they talk about virtual reality okay. If you want to maintain a, a materialistic viewpoint, then you have to say that there are other physical beings who are doing this in this physical universe. And then you say, and it's in the future. And all right, a possibility perhaps, but I think the probability of that is extremely small. It doesn't, it doesn't pass the smell test, as they say. It's got too many things wrong with it. It's overly complex, overly complicated for no apparent reason. Uh, at least that's my viewpoint on that. The other viewpoint, I think, is much more uh, uh, logical and tends to answer a whole lot of other questions. See, that viewpoint doesn't answer the metaphysical questions. That viewpoint doesn't uh, explain, you know, how the paranormal works. That viewpoint doesn't give you uh, uh, answers about uh, theology. It doesn't give you answers about you know, C being the the uh, the speed limit. It it's a all that it can say for itself is that it maintains the concept of material of of a material reality, which we know is really not a good concept to begin with. So I find it a very flawed idea, not a very likely idea, but probably not an impossible idea. Like a lot of things, there's a lot of things that are that are possible. There's a much smaller set that are probable.
Well, thank you, Tom. Um, I do think that that is the uh, that type of virtual reality concept where the technically advanced civilization is in a physical setting. They're trying to place it in a physical setting. The interesting thing, though, that he talks about is the protocol known as CE5, which involves positive conscious intent can initiate contact with advanced ter extraterrestrials. Well, that sounds like your theory of just we are connected as consciousness. Now we're not connecting with a, an advanced physical, te uh, technologically advanced civilization, we can contact another consciousness that is outside of this uh, yes. reality. I, so I would that agree with, part fits. <clears throat> yeah, I would agree with that. We are, all consciousness is netted. We're all connected to each other. So yes, consciousness can talk to consciousness. You don't have to have a body here in this, this PMR to uh, be on that net. All consciousness is netted. You can talk to your dog and you can talk to your cat and they, uh, they can... Uh, talk to you as well. You have to talk at their level, but that's, you know, that's possible. So we're all netted. Now, all we ever get is the data. We get the data and we interpret the data. So if you are a materialist and you get data from some other being, well, right away, our interpretation of a being is sort of humanoid like us, because that's how we see beings. We don't say, oh, I got a message from a being, you know, and you don't think of it as like, uh, you know, a three-headed chicken or, uh, you know, a, a burning bush maybe or uh, some other kind of a thing. It's we interpret anything that talks with us as a being and we imagine it to be sort of like us because we're limited in our imagination of things that we're not familiar with. So that's all we get's the data. When you turn it into an extraterrestrial, that's what you're adding to it. You don't get that. You just, that's your interpretation of that data, of where it comes from. If you happen to be a materialist, then you would tend to make it an extraterrestrial because every being must come from some physical place. You see, if you're not a, a materialist, then those beings don't necessarily have to come from a physical place. They could be non-physical to us. They could be in another dimension. So it's all in how you interpret the data. And you could ask those beings, well, where do you live? And they may say, well, I'm, you know, live in such and such a galaxy someplace else in, in your universe. But that's just information. You never really get that as a fact. That's just what they tell you. That's what you hear. That's how you interpret the data. So I'd say stay skeptical, you folks, speaking to the aliens. You are no doubt speaking to somebody to something, you're getting information. Uh, whether or not it's exactly the way that you interpret it or not, you should stay skeptical. I'm not saying that you're wrong. I'm just saying that you should stay skeptical of your own interpretation. I tend to m make very little differences in, in sources anymore. Um, trying to understand the source is really impossible. You don't ever get the source. You just get information. Now, that information can describe a source, but then it's your interpretation that creates that description. So always be skeptical about that. But no doubt, you can converse with other individuated units of consciousness, wherever they may be. Thank you, Tom. I think that's, uh, that really clarifies that whole scenario there. Uh, the next question from the MBT forum. Um, I wonder if Tom would discuss the concept of hate. I find hate rather interesting. Most hatred is, is conceived from love and caring. Is it impossible to hate something and not care about it? And caring about stuff is a good thing, right? Why is it that love can turn into hatred? Why is it that caring deeply about something that's beautiful can turn into something as awful as hatred? Wow. Well, there is a, a bunch of words used in strange ways. Okay. Um, love does not turn into hatred if love is really love. Um, they're, they're not all mixed together like that. Hatred is, a, is you know, fundamentally attached to a fear. You hate the things that that uh, cause very strong, fearful reactions in you. 
It's a fear-based thing. Fear is the opposite of love. Love is about other, about giving. And you can say, yes, okay, because I hate something, I care about it because I care so much about it. I want to get rid of it and kill it. You know, that's how I care. But that's not what we're talking about. You're taking the word care and and uh, changing its, its meaning or, or generalizing it past the point of what we intend. When we talk about caring, we're talking about caring about other people, caring in a, in a positive way, not caring to want to destroy them. It's caring. Caring about them is, the, is, is a positive thing. Uh, if, we, uh, if we want to change it to a negative thing, we probably would change the word from caring to something else. Um, so I think there's a lot of confusion in what the words mean in that question. Um, love is about other. It's about caring. It's about cooperation. When it's about other, it's not about hating other. It's about uh, helping other, but giving to other. It's about being of service. What can I give to this situation? How can I help? Not how can I destroy it? That's uh, not what we mean when we say caring. Like I say, hate is a fear response, and it can be a belief response, either one. But belief and, and ego are both tied to fear. It can be an ego response. It's just a very strong negative feeling is how we can define hate. Um, I'm not sure what else to say about that, um, Donna. Okay. Um, yeah, I think fear is the fundamental true. thing. That's yeah. Fear is the fundamental thing that is is the source of of the hate in terms of belief and ego both. But hate's a very negative thing, a very high entropy thing. Caring and, and giving. And love are very low entropy things. Well, I think you cleared up all that jumble very well. Oh, uh, I don't then... know that I did that, but at, at least it, you know, okay. I tried. You did. All right. The question uh, from Dom on the MBT forum concerns meditation and high functioning Asperger syndrome. You've mentioned a number of times and in various ways that it's essential to work towards gaining robustness of the, of the meditative state if you want to get good at it. You frequently use the analogy of being in a bus full of school children and still being able to be proficient with it. What would be your advice to someone with high functioning Asperger's who has innate noise sensitivity? Is this simply an artifact of low consciousness quality? In your opinion, is this a limitation that can be overcome? Uh, no, it's not a, it's not a, uh, uh an attribute of low quality of consciousness. If you have Asperger's, if you uh, have ADD and you are, um, you know, your central nervous system is such that it's very hard for you to be in a noisy environment and not be distracted, then that's a disadvantage over somebody that doesn't have those, those uh, problems of Asperger's or say ADD. <clears throat> and that means that you probably will need uh, to find quieter places and that uh, when you practice making your meditation more robust, a school bus full of children is probably not a good choice for you. It may be taking a walk in a park would be a good choice for you where you can have to pay attention to your meditation, pay attention to where you're going in the park so you don't step in a hole or run into somebody or walk out in the street. So you have several things you have to pay attention to at the same time. That would be maybe more fitting. The school, bu the, the school bus full of kids uh, would probably be a bad idea for somebody who uh, has a, a, uh, a particularly acute um, what response to noise or to a noisy or a distracting environment. Even. Work with what you have. You can still develop. It's not going to. It's not going to handicap you in growing up or in developing a robust meditation. You'll just have to do that other ways, and you'll have to uh, maybe go to the limits of your distraction and try to do that. But if the distractions get to be too much, then back off. Don't uh, don't take it that far. You'll still be able to develop, you know, just as well as if uh, you know you didn't have the ADD or the Aspergers. So it's not a problem. It doesn't mean you have a low quality of consciousness. It just means you're going to have to find other ways to challenge yourself in order to accomplish this robust meditation. 
So you're fine. Um, don't go to places that are intrinsically difficult for you to stand. Okay, we're running a little short of time. Um, if any of you who had extra questions would like to ask one more question, we can fit that in. That was either TD, Nicholas, or Eric. Uh, you mentioned that you have the exact same uh, experience as Monroe. And that got me the question is, is that uh, the same for all of us that you go through the same lessons, you can say, or, or is it just happening as a coincidence? Well, I, th I don't know that it's the same for everybody, that everybody goes through the same questions. But I do think that the larger conscious system has some tests it gives us. And primarily, that's just to see where we are, because if it's interested in helping us out, it has to know where we are. You know, teachers do the same thing with their with their students. They give them tests so they know, you know, where their students are so they know better how to teach them. And I think some of these tests work out really well. They're very effective tests, so they use them again and again. Otherwise, they you know, they make them standard tests, if you will. But it doesn't mean that everybody gets them. Um, it's just that some people will end up getting the same tests. I've had similar things with that with other people, not with Bob. There's other people I've talked to that have had some very similar uh, experiences, sometimes in what you'd call an out-of-body experience. And the, the, the interactions they had, the people were there, the events, the situation, the whole setup was basically exactly the same as something that I had experienced many years earlier. So I think these are tests in order to see whether or not we're ready to go on to the next step or whether we need more work or whether we're already in over our heads. And the ones that work, why not reuse them? So I think that's all it was. I don't believe everybody gets the same the same thing, but there are some tests that are kind of um, you know, reused enough that uh, you're likely in your lifetime to run into several other people that have had identical experiences to you in a test kind of situation.